Hi, I'm Rahul Akerkar, the chef and founder of Qualia in Mumbai, and I'm Scroll Foods' first chef of the month. All this month, read my recipes on Scroll Food, watch my videos on Facebook and Instagram, and I'll even share a few kitchen secrets with you. Watch my videos on Facebook and Instagram, and I'll even share a few kitchen secrets. First we also launched a new Watch product. Watch my videos on Facebook and Instagram. And I'll even share a few kitchen secrets. And our first type of the month is Chef Rahul Akhirka of Kualia Restaurant. Watch my videos on Facebook and Instagram. And I'll even share a few kitchen secrets. Mumbai and Watch my videos on Facebook and Instagram. And I'll even share a few kitchen secrets. Aman, can you hear us? Yeah, I can. Oh, I can't. Finally, this is like the worst nightmare come true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I was just introducing our, our uh, scroll food, and this is Aman Khanna, our editor for Scroll Food, and a lot of other things that scroll. Uh, so tell us a little bit about Scroll Food and what was the whole idea behind it, and you know what kind of response we have gotten. Yeah, thank you so much, Karnika, for inviting me and uh, letting me talk about Scroll Food. We founded Scroll Food in December of last year with the objective of creating an encyclopedia of recipes from India. We wanted to bring under one umbrella cuisines from the north to the south, to the east, to the west. Of course, there have been attempts to document cuisines before, but those attempts have been fragmented and balkanized. We wanted to give those attempts one home. Our attempt, uh, if I may so say so myself, have met with success. Uh, since the beginning of the section, we have documented several micro cuisines, including the food of Konkan Muslims and uh, Pathare Prabhus. But when the coronavirus pandemic battered the restaurant industry along with the rest of the economy, we knew we had to change our perspective. We knew we had to reach out. So we decided to launch a new initiative called the Chef of the Month. Under this initiative, we anoint a great chef as a curator of the section for a month and let them talk about food, about the restaurant industry, about its need, and of course, their own work. We were fortunate that we got to start the initiative with Chef Rahul Akirkar. Um, chef Rahul, as everyone knows, is one of the culinary masters of India. He completely changed the way the restaurant industry works with Indigo, and he's continuing to do fabulous work at Qualia, his restaurant in Mumbai. Through all of June, he gave us a peek into his culinary journey and showed us how he creates magic in the kitchen with his non pareil recipes. Um, so without further ado, I'll leave the stage and uh, I'll let you and Chef Rahul discuss the burning questions of our time. Thanks a lot for joining us, Aman. Okay. So like uh, Aman mentioned, we, Chef uh, Rahul Akhirkar is the, our first scroll chef of the month and we are so excited to have our guys to start with us. So let's bring him on. Hi, Chef. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good. Loving the How time of Corona, right? Ah. <laughs> How is the lockdown treating you? As it's treating everyone else equally. <laughs> so okay. I just, I just, I just want to say thanks, by the way, for having me on the show um, and um, asking me to kick off this initiative of yours, Scroll Food. Um, I think it's great, and I'm real happy to be a part of it. So thank you, Aman, and thank you, Karnika. 
I've been talking to a bunch of friends. Uh, sadly, I've never been to Kuala. My bad luck. I've been talking to a bunch of friends in Mumbai, and it seems like everyone has a Kuala story. And the one thing they talk about is just like you have to go for the experience. Like you have to go and experience the food, and it's just like the ambience and everything. And it's magical, apparently. And I am taking their word. So tell me a little bit about like your journey. What's like your earliest memory of food? My earliest memory of food. Well, um, I remember, you know, in uh, Nasik, uh, my father's parents lived in lived in Nasik, and we used to go there for a month or two every summer. Um, they had a big house and um, uh, two acres, I guess, of, of beautiful garden with full of fruit trees and all sorts of stuff. And my and my Aji used to spend her days cooking in the kitchen. She had this beautiful pantry room also and where she made her own butter and all her own um, like laddus and chuda chaklis all these things um, chutney murabba lonsers everything and i remember hanging out with her and um, you know watching her cook and she'd make me do stuff with her and i taste stuff but my first i think real experience with cooking was you know many years later like 17 years later or so um in college in the states i was in small town pennsylvania in lancaster where i went to college and if i got homesick for indian food the only way i could do it was to cook it myself because there was no indian restaurant there so i got recipes from her and um, basically subjected all my friends you know to being uh, guinea pigs that's how i kind of learned to cook yeah Oh, that that sounds like really uh, interesting. I mean, most of I feel like uh, a lot of us have learned cooking by watching our moms or our dadis or our nannies cook. Yeah. And in my case, it was mostly my dad who cooked. So yeah, most of that. So I mean, you came back to India in the nineties to start a restaurant. So what was the restaurant industry like back then, and how much has it changed? And you know, just like tell us a little bit about like what it was like. I'm sure there must be a lot of bumps on uh, on throughout the way. So in eight, I came back end of eighty nine in November of eighty nine, and really the the restaurant scene here wasn't very evolved. You had a couple of um, in in I guess in the Chinese space there was China Garden in Bombay, and in the Indian food space there was um, um, Khyber. Um, no, Khy yeah, Khyber um, uh, in uh, Kalagoda and. Um, um, there was nothing in the Western food space at all. Um, what existed was in five-star hotels. In fact, most of the restaurants that existed of a particular grade anyway were pretty much in five-star hotels. I mean, there were plenty of eateries outside, but, you know, they were kind of run mom and pop style, you know, where the, where like the owner sat at the uh, gala and counted cash, and, you know, it's a... Uh, um, um, you know, and the cooks were sort of thrust in this inhumane working condition in the back, these sweatshops producing food. Um, of course, the five star hotels and all were different. But um, yeah, so so that was that was kind of the scene that uh, that existed there. And, you know, because everything was in the five star hotels, I guess after a while they just got complacent and they were, you know, it was completely out of touch with what was happening in the rest of the world. So what, what has your experience been like with Indigo and, you know, just starting your own thing and like, especially in a city like Bombay, like what has your experience been? Well, it was, you know, at the time it was, um, it was tough. I mean, I didn't come, firstly, I don't come from a business family background. Uh, both my parents were employees, if you will. Uh, my dad was, you know, he he uh, was a public relations consultant and um, at one point was the executive director of the World Trade Center in Bombay. And he also taught. My mom worked, she manages, she managed the law offices of two American immigration lawyers in Bombay. So I don't come from that kind of background. So to me, setting up a business, um, setting up a, a restaurant was a, a really steep uh, learning curve. Um, you know, I knew nothing about balance sheets. I knew nothing about putting together project reports or any of this stuff. And, um, you know, when I went to, 
I first started with Under the Over before Indigo, mm -hmm. and then we then we moved to Bangalore for a while. But even for like Under the Over, um, just to just to get a loan from the bank and try and understand how to do all this, it, it like took a lot of effort at the time. I think F and B was not a really organized sector, and certainly not even in terms of uh, banking, you know, and in terms of getting financial, um, uh, getting institutional finance. Um, I remember sitting with uh, Syndicate Bank who, who, who helped fund um, Indigo back in the day. And mm -hmm. I had to explain to them, you know, uh, they didn't understand that our plant and uh, machinery was you know tables and chairs and uh, you know they said no but that's furniture and fixtures i said well it's for us it's our plant and machinery and you know yeah. it like took a lot to try and make them understand how the whole restaurant scene worked and how the whole restaurant industry worked because it was i think um in terms of it being organized and an understood industry um here in india there was a huge gap and so setting up back in the day was um, was like a real challenge it was a it was a real trial and error process now of course you've got people throwing money at it so uh, i'm glad you mentioned how you know how what it takes to set up a restaurant and right now i mean since we have been in lockdown since march and the restaurant businesses are suffering the most i feel um you know like i feel like people don't often get to know because you know when you go to a restaurant especially a fine dining restaurant you see all the glitz and glamour and you see like oh god so pretty and so elaborate and you know so lavish and all you think oh my god these guys must be really making a lot of money right but i don't think a lot of people understand what it takes to actually run a restaurant business and you know now that restaurants have been sort of suffering for a while now and the next six months to one year also looks kind of like you know we don't really know what will happen so what do you think like what do you think are the biggest concerns for the industry right now and what are the biggest concerns for you as a entrepreneur as a, as someone who runs a restaurant for the next 6 months or so so you know i think firstly it's a myth that restaurants make a lot of money there is money to be made but it's a very long term play okay in the short term there is no money at all in this in this business and you know people say yeah but you're charging so much for a plate of food well you know, uh, let me add on to that what some of our other costs are. We have really high uh, real estate costs. Um, we have high rents. Uh, our our salaries are um, expensive. You know, and and our uh, utilities, okay, like electricity, gas, stuff like that. And um, you know, we. Typically, our margins that we finally work on are in the low teens. Okay, so our profit, our uh, EBITDAs and stuff are in the low are in the low teens. So, and these are numbers achieved when you um, operate at close to full capacity. All right. So you can imagine that anything that affects your bit, either the revenue stream like covid yeah. or um you know if you or if your expenses are unable uh, to be contained and curtailed somewhat or or like restructured um in both cases you have a severely losing proposition okay so without any cash flow there is no way for us to to like make payments there is no way for us to uh, stay afloat and COVID has become not just for the restaurant industry, for hospitality, for tourism, for travel, you know, for like all these sort of uh, related industries. And, you know, it's a, it's a real existential crisis right now because, um, you know, it's, it's really a question of survival. We don't know whether we will pull through. OK, I think restaurants or organizations that have the luxury and benefit of being institutionally financed um, by a fund, you know, whether they have a fund as a partner who have deep pockets and can keep keep you afloat. Mm -hmm. Or if uh, restaurants that have been in operations for many years and have some reserves to dip back into. These, I think, are the only ones that are going to be able to survive. Um, anybody else who's 
working hand to mouth and most of us are um are probably going to fold because you know i understand and landlords um need to make money from rent too they've purchased places uh they have expenses also they've taken loans you know they have to service those loans but we cannot continue paying 3 4 5 hundred bucks a square foot for rent it doesn't work okay it's not going to work you know we have because of covid when we now reopen uh one of the first things that they, you know we are mandated to be 50% occupied which means you're working at 50% revenue which means you're already losing money all right so i mean the entire ecosystem needs to be rejigged your rents have to come down uh perhaps you don't do rent maybe it's just profit sharing you know in other words or it's just a percentage of turnover that you that you like share with your uh, with your landlord for a while salaries will have to come down but then you know um how much can they come down okay uh, people have to live too because the price of raw materials the price of everything the price of living today has gone up because of covid okay so you have that catch 22 happening there um it's just all the way down the line it is a problem and especially you know most restaurants are designed and have been built on a dine in model in other words two thirds of your place is set up for diners to come in and eat so you've got you know lovely tables and chairs and air conditioning and uh, cutlery crockery and fancy glassware and you spent on the interiors and all that and if you can only pivot to a delivery model um, you are not utilizing two thirds of your place mm-hmm. the other one third um, that you are using uh, you're paying beyond um, fair price for if you will uh because your rents haven't changed and you know it's it's like a no win situation you maybe make a little bit of money um to generate some token cash flow to basically keep your team occupied but other than that you don't have money to pay rent you don't have money to to like even pay your suppliers doing uh delivery from a dine in restaurant people who built a delivery kitchen alone could be eterning a buck because they don't have any of the other overheads to contend with yeah we've already started getting a lot of questions from our readers and one of the question has some a little bit to do with what you just uh, talked about so one of our readers viewers actually wants to know what are the ingredients of building a successful restaurant um if i knew the answer to that one i'd be churning them out <laughs> I'm sure you uh, have it hidden somewhere. I think it's a lot of luck. I it's it's a question of uh, you know it's it's a combination of um I think luck you, you know it's restauranting is a very interesting business because you're dealing with perceptions at the end of the day, right? Um you are trying to understand what you think your customer will dig in terms of food. in terms of taste in terms of experience in terms of price point you know in terms of all these things mm-hmm. so there's a there's a sense of perception management there um at the same time it's also a people management business in that you know it's uh it's human uh driven so you have your staff you have to have a happy team if you don't have a happy team you're not making happy food and you're not um you know creating a happy ex- experience there you know if you have one of your cooks who's come after having a fight at home uh, he you know he brings all that bad energy into his food and and it shows you know um as i say you're only as good as your last meal right you know you can have regular customers that come and uh, dine with you over years and then you go through a bad patch and you put out because of complacency you put out a couple of bad meals and they're going to think twice about coming back so it's it's a real it's a tough business you know you have to be aggressively managing it 24/7 um you know everybody sees the glamour side of it 
which is a successful restaurant and it's busy and it's buzzing and there's fun music playing you know people are watching people watching people watching people um, you know people are eating and drinking and having a good time but it's a lot of work you work when everyone else plays you know and you spend the rest of the time gearing up for those few hours in prepping for it um you know you have to sweat the details you have to really be ocd in order to run a good restaurant you've got to be able to you know really sweat the small stuff it's not rocket science okay but it's it's a lot of active conscious management you know it's like i would say driving a car here in india um through you know you have to be watching the road 180 degrees constantly because you're going to get some idiot who's going to just jump out of the sidewalk and cross the road or there'll be a cow in the middle of a road or a stray dog or something so so you know it's like it's like an active activity it's tiring and it's the same thing restauranting is is consciously active all the time and you have to be that and you know at the same time you're dealing with perceptions right so you don't you're trying to imagine what people will like food wise and price point wise and all those things yeah uh, so, some, so like yeah, if so if it's possible to get all of that together um mm. you should um in theory at least have a successful restaurant then you have issues of course of consistency of mm. competition people ripping you off you know uh, doing stuff like that so it's it's um it is what it is Clearly, clearly, really hard, and you seem to be doing a great job at it, though. Um, one of our viewers seems to be a Qualia regular because he's asking Rahul, "I hope you're going to tell us about all those pickled stuff up on the wall in Qualia and why they're there." Sure. So you know, after I sold out from uh, Indigo and the company, I you know spent a couple of years over my non-compete, and um, I started to think really about the food that I liked. And, um, you know, I remembered, I mean, I just love the whole sweet, sour profile of food, um, the whole sort of agro dolce, amber gourd, uh, which you say in Marathi. And, um, um, you know, there's a, a lot of our food here in India is that you take chart, for example, right? I mean, it's that whole sweet, sour profile and it just uh, it just makes you want to eat it. Right. Um, same thing with uh, margarita. You know, I, I don't want to say too much about that because uh, I can drink many of them. So, so it's the so you know it's the whole sweet sour profile that is great, and and we also started to then therefore do some pickling because that's a great way to preserve um, best of season ingredients to use them later on. Okay, and and the nice thing about it is it's you know unlike freezing and stuff like this, the 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 vegetable or the ingredient that you're pickling or fermenting is actually alive right and and it's really great because the taste evolves the textures evolve the whole thing evolves and it just get it gets beautifully complex in its flavor and you have this bright acidity in there that just makes all the food pop and so we've been we've been at qualia and i mean now we've got stuff that's been pickling for over two two and a half years there now so and and what we do, it's in all our food, right from uh, desserts all the way through our uh, hot food and and also even in our bar. Uh, we like use a lot of pickled uh, compounds as garnishes and we make purees out of them and such, you know, and it, it, it they just add a beautiful dimension to the food. Um, another one of our uh, scroll food readers. Oh, before we get to the next question, for the uh, viewers who don't know that, we have actually two videos of chef pickling tomatoes and okra on our website. So you can go That's to right. scroll, scroll in slash food, or you can check them out on our YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram, Facebook, and Facebook pages. Um, okay, moving on to the next question. Another scroll food reader is asking, what is your food philosophy? What is my food philosophy? It's pretty simple. Um, I like good food. <laughs> That's my <laughs> philosophy. Um, no, I see. I think food. You know, I've always said food needs to take you somewhere, right? You. I think it's taste and smell are the biggest 
triggers of um, of memory and um, you know smell of course is the is the oldest uh, sense in your body right and um, in your in your spirit in your in your being and um, you know I think food should always take you somewhere in that it should always uh, help to sort of stir up um, uh, memories from some place in the past you know which is this whole con the whole thing about comfort food right I mean why is it comforting it's because it makes you think of something from the past or from a time when you were loved and you were safe and um, and and you know it, it it jogs all those memories and there's a instant connect with what you are eating um, uh, and your you know and your past at the same time I think you know food also evolves so it should it must form perhaps the basis of memories for tomorrow you know to to like just stuff food in your mouth to me is is a waste of time i mean it's it, it's a necessity yes to eat you need the nourishment but i think people need to take time to dine because also when you sit down as a, a family at the end of a day and share a meal together you know your heritage gets passed down that way your 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 sense of community is passed down that way um, your uh, you know you like bond with your family i mean these, these are how how uh, memories are created and sustained you know and it's um, and it's all fuel for the soul and and to me that that really is what food should be all about um, not just stuffing your mouth because you have to, you know, um, as you as you like grab a sandwich on the fly. I mean, take the time to sit down and have a meal with someone else and have a conversation. You know, it's it's great. I mean, that's one thing I really love about uh, Europe is the effort that they make to have a meal. And and to me, that's that is really what food is about. Yes, I'll, you know, uh, you can also add stuff like yeah you know um i like food that's cooked well i like food that's interesting but i think that's a given yeah so what's comfort food for you as in what do you eat like you know middle of the night and i'm sure like on days when you are at the restaurant middle of the night means nothing so 4 a.m in that sense for you so what is it that you go for or is it that you cook for yourself cornflakes yeah i love cornflakes <laughs> it's again Day or night, I eat cornflakes with uh, cold milk and uh, like raisins. I, I love cornflakes. Okay, so that um, eggs in any way, shape, or form. Uh, okay. Soft, soft and runny. I love my <laughs> eggs. Um, I love chart uh, in all shapes and form. Sushi. I mean, these are all these are all comfort foods. That at the same time you know i also love i also love my indian food i i love many things and it's and it's you know because of my mixed heritage uh, my taste buds are all over the place right my mom's family were german jews that fled the war and wound up in the states um, mm. in new york and my dad's family are coastal maharashtrians and so you know i've been exposed um, luckily uh, growing up to food from all over the world and so my taste buds are all screwed up uh, you know I sort of uh, jack of all trade is master of none kind of thing so so my um, so my personal uh, sort of food that I love or preferences are it's really mood based I mean there are times I want varan uh, bath you know which is just uh, overcooked overcooked dal and rice like mm -hmm. a kitchen um, there are times I want that. There are times I want to eat uh, sea urchin. You know, so um, it's it's like all over the place. So that's how it is. Uh, like, do you think that the Indian food that Indian food has found its the place you know it deserves on the global you know culinary map? As in, we don't see too many Indian restaurants or like uh, you know even restaurants that are sort of experimenting with regional or micro Indian cuisines because they they have a lot to offer. Yeah, so I think I think Indian food is really coming to its own right now, and it's it's just started this process over the last couple of years, but and I think it's fabulous because we have 
such an amazingly rich and diverse culinary heritage in this country and um, you know you've got like 60 ways to cook potatoes you know <laughs> so it's uh, it's it's just amazing north south east west our food is just so different uh, we come from so many different um, uh, we come from so many different uh, cul culinary traditions historically um, the cuisine is evolved it's rich it's diverse it does you know there's a misconception in the west about it being chili spicy all the time it's not you know um, there are many indian cuisines that hardly use chili you know mm -hmm. so um you have all the different flavor profiles you've got everything happening here and i love the fact that um you know young chefs today are finally turning inwards if you want to call it that and playing and evolving our local culinary traditions and 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 uh, cuisines and it's happening all over the world you know in in london you've got restaurants playing around with you know with uh, very specialized indian cuisine same thing in new york same thing i guess in most major cap you know big cities of the world and i think one of the other thing that's changed internationally also is that there's no need for cooks uh, on chefs and, and restaurants to dumb down the food anymore okay you know, there used to be this tendency, oh, you know, Indian food, you need to cook it for the Western palate. Bullshit. You don't need to do that. Um, so, 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 you know, it's people are, are staying true to, uh, true to flavor and, you know, true to uh, tradition and serving um, uh, uh, correct, you know, if you want to call it that Indian food. And, um, you know, and the fact that we have so much to offer, it's, I think we've just touched the tip of the iceberg because, you know, you can take regional cuisines from this country and take them into the West and nobody knows about them, you know, so it's wide open right now. I think this is the time. It's sad that COVID had to happen now because it's going to slow down the process, but, um, but it will happen. It'll be, it is one of the major cuisines of the world, you know, um, as a collective. Mm. We just got another question from a viewer which I feel fits perfectly here. So they want to know which are your favorite restaurants in Mumbai and which dishes are these restaurants you love the most? I like Kualya for obvious reasons. <laughs> and yeah, I, love all, I love it. all the food there. <laughs> um, I like different restaurants for different things. Okay. I, um, you know, I. I eat a lot at uh, Thakka at Bhojanale. I take chef friends there from all over the world for a nice Gujarati thali. I can't, I can, I, I hate that restaurant. I love that restaurant. I love it because of the food it serves and everything else. I hate it because I always overeat there. It's terrible. I eat, I mean, I eat like some, you know, like 15 chapatis and puris and shrikhand and God knows what else. It's just insane how much I eat there. Okay, so that I like. Um, I mean, uh, I like Ling's Pavilion for a couple of things that it does Chinese. I like Royal China for a couple of things that it does Chinese. Uh, Trishna, I like for 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 uh, for the squid that they do there in in that green brown uh, coconut masala and the. Um, the fried uh, ladyfish carne that they do. Um, and they do this um, uh, mushroom chili, which is, uh, I think it's so bad, it's good. You know, it's this <laughs> Indianized Chinese mushroom capsi green chili thing. And uh, I can't get enough of it. You know? um, I like Bombay Canteen. I like O Pedro. Um, mm. I like mask. I like Americano. I mean, there, there are tons of them that I like. There are tons of them. Oh, I like um, um, Izumi in uh, Bandra. So, yeah, a bunch of them. Okay. I think we have got a lot of good suggestions for next time. You know, we travel and we are in Bombay. Um, so there's another uh, viewer who's asking, he wants to start start an online food, food business which sells juices also, but he feels like the cost of uh, you know, shipping charges are as high as, you know, the product that they're making. Uh, I think like we can use this one to ask you another question is, uh, what is your advice for young entrepreneurs who want to get into the industry and who, you know, have new ideas? And then especially now that, you know, 
uh, delivery and special uh, online ordering and all of that is so big. So now the whole you know um, universe is changing in that sense. Like especially when it comes to ordering and eating food. So what's your advice for new entrepreneurs and new chefs, who, young chefs who want to get into the industry? Well, let's start with young chefs who want to get into the industry. Even I think entrepreneurs. Hmm. Um, we are a skill-based industry in terms of um, what we produce takes skill. Okay, there's no two ways around it. It's not like having a, a plastic factory where you throw plastic pellets in one end of the process and you get buckets coming out the other side, uh, mm -hmm. regardless or independent of who's operating the machine. Um, so. To make good food, you have to have the skills. The skills come from time spent, from experience. Um, that's the only, it's the only way around it. A lot of people get into this industry and they think in a year or two, oh, I'm a chef, you know, I know it all. It's the biggest recipe for failure. Um, you know, I've been in this industry 40 years now, plus um, actually more than 40 years and I still learn every day. Uh, I still make it a point to teach myself something every day. You have to because everything changes, traditions change, cooking techniques change, um, people's people's uh, desires, pe the way people eat change, everything changes and you have to be on top of it. So there's no, um, there's no shortcut for effort. There's no shortcut for experience, for time spent. It's long hours, okay? Um, if you're on your feet a lot and you can't turn around and say, you know, I'm going to work a nine hour day and at the end of it, my shift's over, I'm going home. Bye bye. It doesn't work that way. You have to put in, you have to put in your dues, you know, um, that's one. My advice is work is to work under a few good chefs for a period of time to really um, learn the learn their thought processes, how they translate those onto a plate and into their operations and into, you know, making uh, the experience for their customers. Um, don't jump ship constantly from one restaurant to, a, to another. A lot of people do that. They think working two months in one place and then two months in another, I'm getting all this experience on my resume, but you're actually getting nothing because it takes you a minimum of that time to settle down in a place and then to really evolve working in that place with the team there takes takes another five six months so you know i wouldn't jump ship very very quickly um it's a lot of attention to detail okay so um you know you have to sweat the small stuff constantly the your ability to self uh, motivate is needs to be very high because you know i tell you the toughest part for me is hauling my ass out of bed every day. You know, it's uh, get out of bed, be inspired, go to work, create something cool, you know, have fun. All the, It's tough to do that day in and day out. And you have to do it because it's the only way that you're going to be ahead of the game. It's the only way that you're going to get joy out of your work. And if you're happy at work, then you're then you're making good food and you're doing good things, you know. So, so you know, those are the kind of advice those are the kind of things that I would give. I would tell people patience is uh, is like a big thing, you know, um, uh, nurture the people around you also, you know, don't don't sort of work with this whole thing about, oh, it's secret. It's my secret recipe or something like that. Share, share as much as you can. You know, you need to teach people uh, restauranting and, you know, any part of this business is a business of collaboration. It's a huge team effort and you need to learn to be a team player. It's very important. Uh, you know, you got to keep, got to leave your egos at home and come into work as a team player. Uh, no matter if you're the owner or if you're a dishwasher, it doesn't matter. You have to be a team player or you're not going to be able to make that food and you're not going to be able to serve your customers. So, you know, these are all things, of course, of course, I'm also going to tell you the obvious things like if you're an entrepreneur, make sure you're structured properly, you have enough funds in the bank, da, 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 you know, all of that. But that's the business side of it. I think it's more a state of mind that you really need to look for in this industry, in this business to be to be successful. Yeah, the the the, the tools and the um, and the 
business acumen and stuff that you need to run a successful restaurant business are the same for any business. You know, you want to have good revenues and low costs uh, to to maximize your profits, and 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 that's and that's basically it. Don't lose sight of the fact that it is a business, even though you're dealing with people all the time and making food. It is still a business. You're not working for love and fresh air. Uh, before we move on to the next question, I just want to remind our viewers that we have chef only for 20 more minutes and we have way too many questions up. Okay, so moving on to the next question. Um, you uh, Okay, oh, oh, this looks like the reader has actually read your interview on Scroll Food. Uh, so they ask, you had defied attempts to pigeonhole. You told Scroll Food that one of your diners once said the food is not European or French. Do you believe in serving the food you like? <laughs> I only serve the food I like. <laughs> I mean, why would I serve food I don't like? Okay, uh, you mentioned uh, about how, like, you know, it's all about sharing and nurturing, uh, uh, you know, younger chefs and all. So now that with social media, a lot of it has changed, and now in this post-COVID world, we see a lot of chefs are doing, you know, uh, live demonstrations on social media, and a lot of people are learning from that also. What do you think of this whole exchange that is happening right now around us? Well, I think, you know, COVID has actually done some good too, all right? I mean, we, to, 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 to quote people on um, uh, Coffee with Karan, right? As we said earlier on, uh, <laughs> um, um, we, we, like, we like briefly talked about this earlier on, right? Which was, I think COVID has forced you to become aware of your fellow human being, right? Of, of people around you. Um, you know, because the social distancing mandate, you know, means that you need to be aware spatially of who is around you, right? Um, you don't want to touch things so much anymore because of uh, the risk of contamination. So, you know, I think you're you're less on your phones than you than you perhaps would be outside, at least anyway. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you're concerned about the other person, how they're breathing, whether they're coughing on you, um, you know, and and such. And so I think what's come from all this, and plus, I think because of the social distancing and the lockdown and the isolation that we've all gone through these last three months, um, it's forced us to to rethink the way we interact with the world and with one another. And, you know, that is a great thing because, you um, you know, I think prior to this, it was it was kind of going down the tubes because people were really isolating themselves to the extent that that they just were, you know, so isolationist in uh, in 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 uh, you know being on their phones and constantly staring at their phones and their screens and such. You know, you see you see pictures of people traveling on the subways in uh, New York, and you know everybody is just glued to their to their palms, and no one has any concept of who is around them. But now, because of this, right, everybody is looking at each other, finally, you know, <laughs> the phones are away and, and people are interacting with, with one another. So I think that is a good thing. And I think a lot, I think the way people, um, you know, all the Zoom calls and stuff, I keep saying that it's great. I've, I've had Zoom town halls with friends and family and, and such, that people whom, you know, I last saw as a group seven years ago, and here we are, all are on one platform having a conversation, and um, so so you know, I think that's great. I think there are a lot of co collaborative efforts that have happened this way, and I think we will look and be forced to look at it, reinventing ourselves and the way we dine again. You know, post this. <laughs> Um, another viewer wants to know, and I'm not sure what the question means, but you please enlighten us. They want to know, what do you think about cloud kitchens post-COVID? What do I think of them? Yeah. Do you think it's uh, a good concept? Well, it's, it's, a good, it's a good concept. If you're in the delivery business, yes, that's exactly what it is. Um, you know, um, yes, I think uh, even prior to and even post, uh, Delivery forms a big part of our F&B con con uh, consumption in this country and in all countries. So if you have a kitchen that's only focusing on that, um, the economics might work. I know that I remember reading an article somewhere or some analysis that, that it's a myth that cloud kitchens really actually work. 
um, and it's and I think there's a there's a reason for that is also because of the high commissions and uh, such that the uh, delivery aggregators charge. Um, so you know while you're not spending a lot of money on the uh, on on the front end, if you will, of your operation, you you wind up uh, uh, bleeding a lot to uh, to the aggregators, both for delivery as well as for visibility, right, and accessibility. So, so uh, you need to really take a, a really str a long, hard look at the numbers because it's. Uh, cloud kitchens and delivery businesses are all about the uh, numbers and it's you know it's small percentage points you have to really be on top of it because it can uh, run away from you very quickly um covid covid has proven to be really bad for the restaurant industry especially and you know it's a labor intensive uh, industry and we have been reading really sad news coming from pretty much all major cities of restaurants shutting down and even some really popular restaurants shutting down so by the end of this would you what kind of restaurants do you think will make it and you know what kind of places will have to eventually shut down or you know like you know cut down on staff and you know other things well i touched upon this earlier right i said those that have you know deep pockets will survive um those that don't won't um you know those that are able to rework rents with their landlords it's it's all part of that entire re jigging of the whole ecosystem that has to happen if you're able to do that you stand a chance of surviving if you're not i don't think you will um also i think you know put it this way people are going to be somewhat fearful of going out so they're going to make sure that when they go out, they go out to a place that's really worth it for them. In other words, they are convinced of the health and sanitation and safety aspect of the place they're going to. They are convinced that they're going to get an exceptional meal, that there's no risk involved of getting a sh shitty meal when they, when they go out to a place. In other words, if you're going to put yourself at risk, you want to be able to get your maximum ROI on that risk, right? So, so I think restaurants that are really conscious and sweating all the small details um, and producing good food and well-priced and, and, and are the ones that are going to survive. The rest won't. Um, before I go to the next question um, related to this, uh, I think one of uh, your customers is sort of complaining, mm -hmm. saying, why aren't the pickles on the menu? I think you should start selling. Yeah. The on, big vegetables on my but, on my uh, takeaway menu. Yeah, I don't know. We uh, we we actually that's not true. The there are pickles on the on the menu, um, but um, if you if you want some, just call in and we'll send some to you. I have no problem with that. Um, I, we just we just. Took, we just chose to do more, I think, straight ahead comfort food for delivery than um, getting very uh, esoteric in a way um, or, or, or getting very focused in a way for our home delivery. Um, so so the food is simpler and, and a lot more fun, I think, for home delivery. Uh, but if you want pickles on your food, just tell us and we'll add it to your order. No problem. Um, what do you? Uh, so there has been. A, I'm sure you must have read about the uh, economic bailout package that the government announced a few weeks ago. There's, there isn't anything in there for the restaurant industry or the F&B industry or, or on the whole. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what kind of support that the government can provide to the industry in this moment? Well, let's put it this way: they need to provide something. They haven't provided anything. Um, you know, we're an industry where whether directly or indirectly, um, we employ tens of millions of people. And um, uh, we've got no support from the government. We also you know, provide a huge quantum of money to the exchequer by way of taxes and, and uh, everything else. And, we, and we've gotten no help. Um, yeah, there, you know, there's some 
that small thing where they say as an uh, MSME business, you can, you know, you can avail of a loan and stuff, but, but that's just pittance. Okay. It's not going to help in England. For example, the government um, paid for 85% of uh, restaurant hospitality employee salaries. Um, so you were, so even during lockdown, um, you could continue paying your people because the money came from the government, not from your pocket as a, as an employer without any cash flow. And so businesses are able to survive. Okay. Um, on the one hand here, the government says you cannot lay off people. You cannot fire people, but then don't give you, uh, then don't provide an op an option or an uh, or an understanding of where you're supposed to get those funds from to pay them when you're in lockdown. Okay, so there are numerous things like this, and it's been it's been pretty tragic, I have to say. You know that 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 the kind of support that we have gotten is really non-existent. The it's it's all token support. I mean, even take for example the excise. Um, they. Uh, the the exa is license here at Maharashtra. They've like raised the fees fifteen percent from last year. Okay, now you know. Okay, so they allowed you to pay it over four months, um, starting in June rather than March. Um, but the point is, you know, we're not earning. How are we supposed to pay these? Okay, um, we have some. We have utility companies, for example, which are state run. Some of them. Um, and even the private ones who 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 haven't given us any any support, you know, it's like I don't care, pay 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 your bill, or we're going to cut off the power. Um, so so you know we're all bleeding, and and it's you know we we need help from the government. There there have to be uh, tax breaks. There you know there there has to be financial aid made available. Um, there. You know, there like has to be uh, easing of uh, various restrictions. Uh, you should be allowed to set up, let's say, tables outside on the sidewalk so that you can get more people socially distanced like they're doing overseas. Um, there's a lot of stuff that they could be doing, you know, which they're not. And it's very frustrating. You are uh, a part of the NRAI, that is the National Restaurant Association of India. Uh, their task force, uh, their COVID task force. What is the uh, association doing for the industry? And how are you guys li 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 uh, liaising with the government? Then? So, so the NRAI makes a lot of representation to the to the various uh, ministries and to various government bodies and to various people therein um, and and we basically lay out um, uh, sort of a what it is scenario for them and we and we ask for uh, you know and we ask for certain accommodations like for example we are you know currently uh, with the with like the excise department here in Maharashtra we've we've asked them to actually wave off the first quarter of this year's fees because we haven't been able to use the license for the first mm -hmm. quarter. So, you know, things like this, there's all this representation being being made from a tax point of view, from um, uh, from all the things that I talked about earlier. Um, um, the, the, you know, we can't uh, dictate policy, but but like we can but we can certainly help um, uh help government and and help our members in in um, approaching all these issues and giving them ammunition to at least tackle them you know we also have uh, talks going on with uh, with like landlord bodies with uh, with mall owner bodies and and such about about rents and things like that uh, so we have time for one last question and I'd like to end it on slightly happier or nicer note. So uh, dining is now open in most states at certain capacity. Uh, so what is your advice for the uh, you know, customer who wants to come in but is a little scared? So what would you tell them? Just go out and eat. Support them. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? Um, you need to be mindful, yes. You know, wear a mask. 
do your uh, temperature checks, do, you know, um, uh, wash your hands, do all those things, you know, do all the systemic um, pandemic management health things that everyone's talking about. Um, be mindful that the restaurants you're going to are hopefully making an effort to take care of all these things and to do things correctly. Um, it's new to everyone. You know, mistakes will happen. So don't be too hard on people right now. It's after three months, firstly, of no business. We're now reopening uh, three and a half months. We're now reopening and we're reopening with some very stringent um, uh, conditions and rules and safety regulations. And everyone's bound to make some mistakes. So, so cut us a little slack. If you see stuff happening, bring it to the attention naturally of uh, of uh, of the management saying that you could do things a little differently. I'm sure everyone's keeping an open ear and will be willing to help out however they can. Everyone's desperate for your business. Uh, it's the only way we can survive. So for God's sakes, come out and eat. Uh, but just do it responsibly. That's all. And if they don't want to go out, they can always go to Scroll Food and check out your recipes and cook them at home. <laughs> they can choose them in the Rahul Arcade, right? There you go. Thanks a lot for this, Chef. We had a lot of fun and we still are getting a lot of questions. So maybe we will email them to you and get some answers for our, our viewers later. Thanks All a right. lot. And I look forward to uh, coming to Kualia soon. All right. And I hope you make it too. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks for watching us today. We will be back um, in um, the next month with the new chef of the month. So stay tuned and go to scroll.in slash food to check out exclusive recipes by Dahula Kerker and keep cooking and stay safe. Thank you.